Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma session. We have our local audience. We call this the Sangha. This is our community. We live together, we learn together. And we have our virtual community which is in many ways just as much a community on those of you on Second Life we have audio streaming for those of you who manage to find it and of course we're live on YouTube which is I think our largest audience So I was asked today I was asked today about Buddhism What is Buddhism? I want to learn something about Buddhism It's really a hard thing to to teach and Buddhism is Buddhism is a real patchwork Many different things So much that it really does appear to be an attempt to Describe Reality Or, or the universe In all of its many forms Not just one form Not just the form that I talk about uh, the Meditation point of view But Cosmology um, society, sociology, even biology to some extent. What we can do is try to describe Buddhism. Uh, because, like for example, when we when we study medicine, there's so much to study. Right. Each disease is unique And if you start talking about the various diseases you know, It's very hard to get you, know, you, you, you see how vast is the subject you're dealing with If you try to explain what does a doctor do Or what is it like What is medicine What, what is it like to treat a sickness? Well, it's quite a sort of subject that is quite complex because each disease is different and there's many levels of treatment. But I think Buddhism is the same, but you still get an idea that, like a, like a, a physician, the Buddha was a sort of, a specific sort of individual and his teachings were of a specific sort so we get for example after the buddha after the buddha became enlightened he went to he went to isipatana a a forest and there was sort of a, a a refuge of sorts a national park maybe the equivalent where there were five ascetics staying, five ascetics who had, of course, practiced with him when he was torturing himself, himself. And they had abandoned him because he stopped torturing himself, and he found what we call the middle way, right? So the Buddha's teaching is often described as the middle way. I don't, don't think that's particularly insightful or all-encompassing, but it is. It does give some. Insight, and it is a, a very common way of describing the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha himself, right? He said he used to torture himself. He used to uh, indulge, enjoy life, enjoy pleasure, and he realized that neither one made him happy. Enjoying life or enjoying sensual pleasures didn't actually make him happy. 
didn't prepare him for old age, sickness, death. You know, it didn't make him a better person. didn't even make him a happier person. It just made him a greedy person, a person who wants more and more. And torturing himself also didn't do much, right? Like today, how we try to sometimes do the right thing or, or be a hard-working individual. Some some people go out and work, or some stay at home and take care of children, but they work really hard. And like the Buddha, some people go off and do religious practice and push themselves and force their minds and force themselves to give up, to 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 suppress their defilement, trying to get rid of them, thinking that if you force them away or if you push them hard enough, they'll just go away. I would realize this wasn't the case either. You could starve yourself to death. You still wouldn't be free from suffering. So he found the middle way. But it's not how it was most often described. In the middle way, it's a very interesting analogy. It's, it's useful. You know, don't torture yourself, but don't indulge. I mean, it's this idea of just experiencing. It's, it should resonate with us meditators, right? When we have good experiences. Well, we're not trying to stop them, trying to torture ourselves. But at the same time, indulgence or chasing after them isn't viable either because they're impermanent and you're just going to get stressed right you have a good meditation one time and next time when it's not good you you suffer but um, after the five ascetics became enlightened I have a uh, Asaji, the one of the five. There's a story of him going on alms round. They all dispersed and went their separate ways. And Asaji was going on alms round and he met or he was seen by uh, Upatissa, a man, a Brahmin man, I believe, named Upatissa. And Upatissa knew right away, Upatissa was friends with another man named Kolita, and they had both left home and traveled throughout India, poor and um, sort of as, as religious mendicants, and looking for a teacher and saying to each other, whoever finds the teacher who can teach us the path to freedom, we will immediately come back and tell the other one and we will both become disciples of that teacher. Anupatisa saw Asaji and he said, this monk, I've never seen anyone like this. He watched him walking for alms, walking mindfully. He watched him walking through the streets. When he looked, when he reached, when he the way he carried his robes, the way he carried his bowl, the way he walked, the way he talked. There's something special he knew right away. And so after the after Asaji left the city with whatever alms food he had gained, sat under a tree, uh, Upatissa watched him eat after he ate, came up to him, bowed down to him and said, Please, Tell me what is this teaching that you have that you practice? And he said it's the teaching of of the Buddha. And he said, Tell me his teaching. What is it that he teaches? And Dasaji said something and they say that it's because he he saw that this was some other some ascetic from a different religion and he wanted to impress him and be clear to him, look, this isn't something you take lightly. And so he said, oh, sir, I, I, I'm new to the this teaching. There's, there's no way I could tell you it. He wanted to, 
wanted to ex uh, express to him how profound the teaching was. Because the truth is, Asaji was uh, was enlightened, so he was quite capable of of explaining in some detail. You know, he he hadn't learned, of course, all that we have now learned about the Buddhist teaching after his forty five years, and all that has been collected and said and taught and explained about it. But Upatisa said, it doesn't matter, little or a lot, just give me the gist. I know that you know, I know that you know the teaching, I can see it in you. Tell me the, the gist of it. And so this is a useful, um, we have this useful quote that gives us a glimpse of what the Buddha's teaching is about, and it's, Ye dhamma hi tupabhava, uh, te sang dhammang tathagata ahu. Which means basically the the whatever dhammas arise uh, whatever dhammas arise by the cause arise based on a cause. The Buddha has taught these dhammas. Has taught the cause of those dhammas. Right. De sang hetung tathagata ahu. That's right. De sang ye sang dhammang tathagata. Ye sang dhammang hetu pabhava. De sang hetung tathagata ahu. The Buddha has taught the cause of those dhammas. Right, okay. Apologies. Uh, and the and the cessation, and their cessation. What does this mean? He has taught what causes dhammas to arise, and the cessation of those dhammas. That's what the great sage has taught. Doesn't sound like much, right? That one verse, uh, Upatissa became a Sotapanna just by listening to it. So it has an important kernel of truth to it. Something that was never heard before. Something that was new to Upatissa with all of his religious and spiritual training. Something he had never come across. And that is that that is this idea of cause and effect. So when we talk about Buddhism and the Buddha's teaching, we often refer to it as a teaching of cause and effect. We hear a lot about karma. And karma being a, a Buddhist idea. So of course before the Buddha before the Buddha came around, there was this idea that there were certain acts that were special, and the acts themselves had good or bad results. Uh, superstition. If you rub a rabbit's foot, it's good luck. If you walk under a ladder, bad luck, that kind of thing. And the Buddha changed that. The Buddha's idea of karma was very different. It's how we understand it today, generally, that if you do good things, if your intentions are good, you'll get, you'll get a good result. That there's a causal relationship. It's not superstition. That there is a order to the universe And more importantly that there is an order to experience Meaning that our experience is not just random And we're not in complete control of our reality We have to follow rules There are rules of cause and effect If you plant a lemon seed, you don't get an orange tree and vice versa. If you do a good deed, if you do a good deed, good deed, good things come to you. Or something of a kind. It's not quite so simple, but uh, good leads to good, evil leads to evil in some form or other. Because it changes your mind. And so, Upatissa, for Upatissa, this was enough. This is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. And he realized, he was able to, to see, 
just from listening to that it just clicked and he realized he realized the the nature of reality as being I mean, something very profound something that none of us could I think but but it resonates very strongly when you start to realize that and our experience is, is causally based suffering has a cause and all you have to do is stop cultivating that cause to see that we're doing it to ourselves and the Buddha himself would go on quite often to, to describe this causal relationship when you, when you learn about the Four Noble Truths Four Noble Truths are, are very much this that suffering is not something that you have to just um, try and, and um, try and assay, assuage through uh, through medicine or, or through dealing with the results you know, suffering is actually something that you can prevent really that's what it means uh, there's a cause for suffering and if you remove that cause you don't suffer that's basically it that you don't have to just deal with the results which is quite profound really I mean we think normally of suffering as something that comes from without you can't stop other people from attacking you you can't stop sickness from coming to you you certainly can't stop old age and death so how could you possibly end suffering, right? How could you possibly free yourself to completely from suffering? It's like the idea of how you can free yourself from defilement, from evil, from anger, from greed, from delusion. We think, well, these are very much a part of who I am. How could I possibly be free from them? So this is what is profound about the Buddhist teaching, that you actually can be free from these things. And so he, he boldly claimed the path to being free from craving and that that's all it took if you just stop reacting to things you would stop suffering and of course he went on to teach uh, Paticca Samuppada which was really the more detailed explanation of the Four Noble Truths that's what I talked about a few days ago how ignorance leads to its ignorance and ignorance lead to formations, formations lead to consciousness, and so on. How craving leads to clinging, clinging leads to becoming. So this idea of causality is very important. If you want to learn what is Buddhism, this idea of cause and effect and how it plays out in our practice of course is seeing you know you see you see what you're doing to yourself you start to see hmm i'm hurting myself and practically speaking this is what you're this is a description of what you're going through seeing what you're doing to yourself and once you give it once you remove the ignorance and you see that Nothing is worth clinging to, and craving just leads to more, more craving and clinging and suffering. That that knowledge, that wisdom, frees you, as we've talked about. So cause and effect. Another really important, and maybe a little more um, mundane or or simple way of understanding the Buddhist teaching, we have. What we call the Avada Patimokha. It's related. It's very much the same thing, but another way of looking at it, perhaps. It's where the Buddha says, Sabha papa sa akaranang kusala supa sampada sa citta pariyoda panangitang buddhana sasanam. It's in the Dhammapada. When asked, what do, what do Buddhas teach? When the Buddha would remind the monks early on, this is what he would remind the monks to not do any evil, to be full of good and to purify one's mind this is the teaching of all Buddhas 
So this was less less theoretical than the whole cause and effect thing. This is a more practical and and simple way of looking at the Buddha's teaching, and it's also very accurate. Because of course, evil is that which leads to suffering. Good is that which leads to happiness, but without purifying your mind, without the wisdom, insight, knowledge, understanding, you can't ever be free from from evil. You, you can never truly be good. You can never purely be good. This is the difference between forcing yourself to be a good person, pushing yourself into keeping moral precepts and living a good life. And actually, truly, and, and really being a good person, and truly and completely freeing yourself from any potential for evil. It's quite a different path to the purification of the mind. If anyone asks about Buddhism, it's very simple. Like, this is what I teach to kids, this one. I want them to remember, if they remember nothing, Buddhist kids, I mean. I often go and teach Buddhist children, and they've been taught such a such a wide range of things that they can often uh, often find that they're unable to answer the question: What is Buddhism? What did the Buddha teach? It's, uh, it's like asking someone what's in the dictionary. I can't really describe it. This is a very useful sort of index or snapshot of the Buddha's teaching. And for our practice, I mean, this should resonate. What you should see is, may not have been, I mean, for some people I think it's not quite what they were expecting, but this really is a question of good and evil. I don't suppose everyone comes into meditation thinking, yeah, I'm going to get rid of all evil and be be full of good. But there's no way to avoid it. I mean, that is the issue, what's at issue here. There are certain things about us that are evil. And by evil, we mean they cause us suffering. And there are certain things that are good that we need to develop because they free us from suffering. And the practice of doing this is the purification of the mind. When you purify your mind, you accomplish the other two. You you accomplish this uh, this task. Of you win the fight against evil for the force of good. But you see, I mean, there's much to talk about. Just like with medicine, there are many ways of explaining, describing, and detailing what it means to be a doctor, as I said. Another really good one, and the last one I'll leave you with tonight, just to confuse you even more perhaps, is the uh, ten questions, the Kumara Panha, the ten questions of the child. So I, I, I think this is supposed to be... Um, I can't remember. It's maybe story. Maybe questions asked, taught to Rahula, or at any rate, they're questions that are to be taught to novices, to young people. Now that take a fairly special young person to understand these. I mean, not all of them are completely clear to me. I won't go through them in very much detail, but just to give you a sense. I mean, this is. What you would teach a newcomer to Buddhism, what you teach someone who is just learning about, even not just Buddhism, but it's what you might teach a child if you wanted them to have a, a basic understanding of what is what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be here? And so it's ten questions, and each one is, is about uh, that number of things. So the first question is, what is one? Eka namaking. The second question is, what is two? Duena making. Meaning there is one this, two, three, three of this, four of that, five of it, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Makes it easy to remember. And it gives us a picture of the sorts of things that were thought to be most important. 
So the first is sabe sata ahari titika, ahara titika. All beings subsist by food. And that's a fairly deep, I mean, it sounds, this one, on the face of it, sounds strange. But it, this goes back to cause and effect. Food means not just physical food, it means there is cause. There are four kinds of food, and we could get into that, but um, it basically means that we are causally produced. Not just physical food, but mental food as well. We feed into who we are. We become what we become is based very much on um, various types of nourishment, physical and mental. So it's a giving an, a grasp of or a, a glimpse into cause and effect. Two is what is two is uh, body and mind. So these are really looking at these. It's very much a description of how the Buddha would describe reality, a description of reality. He's kind of detailing, outlining reality. Body and mind, very important for meditation, right? You start to see, and these are the questions I asked you early on, is there only the rising or is there also the mind that knows that it's rising? Are the mind and the body one thing or separate things? Uh, body and mind is a, is, is a teaching uh, to bring the person, to bring the individual closer to experiential reality, to stop thinking in terms of concepts, you know, the, these things that we see, people, places, things, they're actually only in our minds. What hap What is happening, what is going on when you see things, when you experience the world around you is all up here you know it's processing experience we don't actually see people we don't actually know whether they're there or not what we know is that we're seeing and hearing and smelling and that there are experiences both physical and mental and that's the basis of reality so body and mind this idea of entities and things is just a mental construct. We don't know whether they exist or not. We assume that they do. But our what's the, the reality of the situation is that it's merely a concept in the mind. Number three is three feelings. So feeling is a very important aspect. A positive, painful feeling, pleasant feeling, neutral feelings. The Buddha put great emphasis on feelings. Uh, sensations painful, pleasant and neutral um, they have very much to do with our with, with good and evil right? very much to do with defilement good feelings lead to greed neutral, neutral feelings can as well they can lead to delusion as well painful feelings lead to anger feeling turns out to be the, the catalyst if you uh, when you experience feelings, that's where defilements come from. That's where suffering starts. If it's a good feeling, you get attached to it. If it's a bad feeling, you just get upset about it. Even with neutral feelings, you can become attached or deluded about them. Arrogant, conceited, and so on. So we often pay special attention to feelings. Number four is the Four Noble Truths. We talked about that. Number five is the five aggregates. This is really just a hodgepodge, but it really gives you a sense of the various aspects of the Buddha's teaching that are important. The five aggregates are, of course, what make up an individual. We could talk about that. That's the kind of this is the kind of list that would lead you deeper. Each one of these can be discussed in greater depth. Number six is the six senses. So the five aggregates and the six senses, this is the basis of reality. Every time you see, hear, smell, taste, feel, or think, there's the five aggregates. There's the physical, there's the feeling, there's the con recognition, there's the thought, the thought about it, the formation, and what you think about the object, and there's consciousness, the awareness that allows it to be possible. 
each time you see here, some of the five aggregates are the uh, building blocks of experience. Number seven is the seven bojangas, so getting into actually doctrinal teachings. The bojangas are those things that lead us to enlightenment. When you when you practice, what what do you cultivate? You cultivate mindfulness. You cultivate effort. You cultivate introspection, and so on and so on. Eight is of course the eightfold noble path. This is the middle way that the Buddha taught morality, concentration, wisdom. There's a lot to talk about there, the eight parts of the Noble Path. Nine is the nine, the satavasa, the nine dwellings of beings. And this is quite complicated, but it deals with the cosmos. As I talked about, Buddhism is not just about experience. It also describes the cosmos. and Or, or maybe cosmos is the wrong word, but it describes the realms of beings human realm, the animal realm, hell, heaven, God realms, things that we often don't talk about as meditators, but which are a part of the Buddhist teaching. The understanding is that, indeed, there are such things as angels and demons and so on and so on, and ghosts, <laughs> believe it or not. And number 10 is not quite clear on. It seems like it's one of two things. It's getting rid of the ten evil courses of action, or it's the cultivated in cultivation of the um, the eightfold noble path plus I can't remember what they're called. The eightfold noble path plus two more factors. Eightfold noble path plus two is ten. And I won't get into it. It's uh, Number 10 is those things that lead you to become an arahant, is basically what it's saying. So, so I most likely haven't given an answer to the question, what is Buddhism? But that's, I think, purposeful. It's a very hard question to answer. What instead I hope I've done is given sort of an outline and to show the sort of, I mean, at least show how one might approach this question and the various ways that one might then delve deeper and talk about each one of these topics and give a whole course on all these things. And also to, to point out that, that the, answer, the question was answered differently in different contexts. For those who are able to understand it, it can be answered in a very deep, profound way. For those who are new to Buddhism or even not even Buddhists, can be answered much sim more simply, as I've pointed out. So hopefully that's helped a little bit, given something useful. It helps us understand. I mean, Buddhism is not it's the idea. Buddhism is not a religion in the sense of trying to convert people. It's a religion in the sense of something that is very definite as a path. You practice it; it has certain results. It's a way that people follow, not because their parents did or because they're coerced into it, but because they want to be free from suffering, because they find it helpful, beneficial, useful. So there you go. There's the Dhamma. There's tonight's Dhamma. Thank you all for tuning in. And you can go back and practice. Don't know if we're going to get to the website tonight. I think what happens is we've become quite popular in our web server is not able to handle the quite popular I mean more people are trying to access it and it just freezes it seems can't handle the load which is kind of distressing because we were told that this I don't know it's under the impression that we had a good web server doesn't appear to be all that 
able to handle the load. Maybe I'll go answer some questions on YouTube. <laughs> Let's see. Let's go answer some questions on Second Life first. How is how are we doing in Second Life? No questions there. Bet YouTube's got some questions. How are we doing on YouTube? Yeah, we've got the usual someone telling them to kill themselves. Well, that's. I'm assuming that that's a problem, isn't it? Why end personal suffering? Hmm. I think that's an interesting question, uh, and I think it comes from the idea that uh, it comes from a, um, a sense of of impersonal logic, right? This idea that the universe can be reduced to impersonal logic. So, just asking this question implies that there should be a logical reason or, or implies that perhaps there isn't a logical reason that it's arbitrary right why not be a terrible terrible person and and fall into suffering what is technically wrong with that and and there's some validity to that but i think and i would argue that it's important to be clear that reality isn't impersonal that suffering rather than being just a subjective thing suffering is a intrinsic building block i mean it's one of the basics suffering good evil um emotion these are not constructs they are realities liking and disliking are real and so it quite simply is the answer quite simply is because suffering is bad <laughs> because suffering is intrinsically bad i mean it, it you have to get out of this idea of reality being impersonal it's not impersonal we call it suffering because there are things that are bad that are painful stressful not not subjectively but objectively i mean they really are um and and that's the and so simply by looking at them personally yeah, objectively i mean from um, from a na from a neutral standpoint you you can't help but come to see it, come to let go of them it's not even a question of deciding to give up suffering it's a question of just looking and when you look you'll see and you'll say mm, yeah, let's get rid of that you don't even have to say it it'll just happen because it's suffering I think that's a good question, actually. <laughs> we got nine one one conspiracy going on here. I can't go through. I can't go through this. It's too much for me. I hope somehow some of you can see why it's difficult to go and answer questions on YouTube. Well, I really apologize that our site isn't working at all. I'm going to have to talk to our people about that. See if that can be fixed. But I will say thank you for tuning in and wish you all a good practice. <laughs>